Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 32 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class, we're going to look at something called the rank of a matrix, okay? And all the rank of a matrix is, is it's the dimension of the range of the matrix, okay? So remember that the range of a matrix, it's this output space of the matrix. It's the set of all things that you can reach from that matrix via matrix multiplication. In other words, it's a collection of all vectors of the form A times X, okay? Well, that set, we showed that that set is a subspace, so it makes sense to talk about its dimension, and that dimension is exactly the rank of a matrix, okay? So that's all that de definition there says. Sort of the point of the rank of a matrix, though, is it's a measure of how much information is in that matrix, or in other words, it's sort of a measure of how non-degenerate that matrix is. Okay, so for example, if you're talking about the zero matrix, well, the zero matrix, it sends everything down to the zero vector, in other words, it squashes everything into the zero subspace. Its range is the zero subspace. So its rank is the dimension of that, which is zero. Okay, so the rank of the zero matrix is zero. Okay, in other words, the zero matrix is sort of the most degenerate matrix that there is. Okay, its rank is as small as possible. It's zero. Okay, well, let's go through another another few examples here just to get, a, again, a bit of a feel for this. Okay, so suppose that now we're looking at the standard matrix of a projection onto a line. What is the rank of that standard matrix? Okay, so just to jog our memory, memory here, a projection onto a line, like what it does is it takes a vector v and just squashes it down at a right angle to a v, which is on whatever fixed line we're talking about here. Okay, so the line, it's gonna be the line in the direction of some unit vector u, and you know, if it is that line, then the standard matrix, we showed this back in week four, the standard matrix is u times u transpose, where we're thinking of u as a column vector, okay? Well, the range of this matrix is just the line that's projecting down onto, right? Remember the range, it's the output space. What are the possible vectors that you can do, get if you do a times v? Well, I can get anything on this line, okay? So that's the range of that matrix. That's the output space. And because it's a line, it's one dimensional, right? Okay, any basis of a line consists of just, well, one non-zero vector on that line. Okay, so the range is a line, it's one dimensional. So the rank of that matrix is one. Okay, it's that dimension of the output space. Okay, so zero matrix is sort of the most degenerate matrix. Its rank is zero. Well, these, these matrices that have a line as their output space, a line as their range, those are sort of the next step up. They're also sort of very degenerate. They're squashing lots of space down just onto a single line. They have rank that's almost as small as possible. They have rank equal to one. All right, what about a rotation matrix? So remember in two dimensional space, we talked about rotation matrices and what they are is they're matrices that just take a vector with tail situated at the origin and rotate it counterclockwise by some angle theta, okay? And the form of a rotation matrix was this, you know, cos minus sine, sine, cos. All right, well, to figure out what the rank of this matrix is, we gotta figure out what its range is, okay? In other words, what are the possible outputs that you can get from this matrix? What are the possible vectors of the form C times V? Okay, well, any vector in R2 can be written in the form C times V, right? Because, I mean, if you have any vector, you could always rotate it back, okay? Like if I wanna get, hey, if I wanna get this vector over here as an output, I would just start over here or so and rotate it counterclockwise by an angle of theta. No matter what output you want, you can get there from some suitably chosen input. Okay, so the range of C of this rotation matrix is just all of R2, it's all of two-dimensional space. And because two-dimensional space is two-dimensional, that means that the rank is two. It's that dimension of the output space. Alrighty. So let's go on and let's ask sort of what nice properties does the rank have? So in general, how could we compute the rank of a matrix and how does it relate to other things that we've seen? Okay, and it turns out that the way that you can compute the rank of a matrix is you just, you do Gaussian elimination to it, okay? So you do exactly what we've been doing to solve linear systems. You just put it down into row echelon form, and then you can eyeball what the rank is from there, okay? So here, here it's big theorem time. How can you compute the rank of a matrix in general? Well, the rank of a matrix is equal to the number of non-zero rows in any row echelon form of that matrix. So there's sort of two things going on here. Every row echelon form of a matrix has the same number of non-zero rows. And if you count them up, you get the rank of that matrix. Equivalently, the rank of a matrix is also equal to the number of leading columns in any row echelon form of A, okay? So remember every non-zero row, it's gonna have a leading entry. If you just count up those leading entries, 
that's the rank of A as well. And also, the rank of A is equal to the rank of its transpose. Okay, so it doesn't matter which of these two matrices you compute the rank of, you automatically get the rank of the other one for free. Alrighty, so where does this theorem come from? Let's just do sort of a sketch proof of the equivalence of all these different uh, properties here. Okay, so we're going to start off with the equivalence of C and D. Why are these two quantities equal to each other? The number of non-zero rows in, in any row echelon form and the number of leading columns in any row echelon form. Why, why are those equal to each other? Well, we sort of already said it actually. Okay, the point is in every non-zero row, there's exactly one leading entry. Okay, and all of those leading entries, they're in different columns. Okay, so there's sort of, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between, hey, number of non-zero rows and number of leading entries and therefore number of leading columns. Okay, there, you can sort of just match them up with each other. So yeah, there's the same number of all of these different quantities. Okay, so yeah, quantities C and D, they're e equal to each other. Next up, we're going to show that quantities A and D are equal to each other, okay? We're going to show that rank is equal to the number of leading columns in any row echelon form of A, okay? Well, the way to go about this is think back to last class when we computed a basis of the range of a matrix, okay? The way we did that was we brought it down to row echelon form, and then we looked at the leading columns in that row echelon form, and we said, hey, well, let's just take the same columns in the original matrix A, okay? And that gave us a basis. So then, well, how many members were there in that basis? Well, it was the same as how many leading columns are there in the row echelon form, okay? And that's all you need. That's exactly what we're saying here. Rank of a matrix, that's equal to the dimension of the range. And well, what is the dimension of the range? Well, that's how many things are in a basis of the range. Well, that was exactly the number of leading columns in the row echelon form. Okay, so this came from an example that we saw in the previous class. We didn't actually prove it as a theorem, but we sort of justified that you can get the basis of a range just by looking at these leading columns and taking the corresponding columns from the actual original matrix A. Okay. And last but not least, we gotta convince ourselves that B and C are similar, okay? So we've already shown, or sorry, equivalent. We've shown that C and D are equivalent, and we've shown that A is now equivalent to them. Now we've gotta show that B is equivalent to one of the others, so let's show that B and C are equivalent to each other. So let's show that the rank of A transpose, in other words, the dimension of the range of A transpose, is equal to the number of non-zero rows in any row echelon form of A, okay? Well, the way to get at this is just remember that range of A is equal to the span of its columns. So the range of A transpose is gonna be the span of its rows. Well, if the range of A transpose is the span of its rows, that means the dimension of the range of A transpose. Well, we've gotta find a basis of this range of A transpose. And the way that we can find a basis is we just look at the rows of its row echelon form, okay? And I mean, there's a bit of a theorem going on in the background here. But hopefully this is sort of believable, okay? Let's go back just to an example where we computed, you know, a row echelon form here. We started off with the original matrix A and we did row operations, row operations, row operations. We got a row echelon form, okay? And remember, each of these row operations is reversible, okay? So if we sort of undo these, we, we go from the row echelon form backwards, then we can get any one of these rows as a linear combination of these rows over here, right? Right. Elementary row operations, they're just particular special linear combinations. So we do a linear combination and then another linear combination and then some more linear combinations and we get any one of these rows that we want as a linear combination of these three rows down here. Okay, so that tells us that every row in the original matrix is a linear combination of these three rows down here. Okay, and linear independence, because of this sort of stair-step pattern of the leading entries, linear independence also isn't too hard to show. Okay, so what happens is <clears throat> these non-zero rows, you throw them together in a set, you get a basis of the span of the rows, which is exactly the range of A transpose. Okay, and then that finishes the proof. Okay, so that's sort of hand wavy, you know, just saying out loud what the proof is, but the idea is just, you know, you take the non-zero rows in a row echelon form, you get a basis of range of A transpose, so therefore the number of non-zero rows is exactly the dimension of that range of A transpose. In other words, the rank of A transpose. All right, that's enough of that. That's enough of theorems. Let's go through an example. Let's compute the rank of some matrix, okay? And the way you do this, eh, 
get down into row echelon form. Okay, so I'm going to start off. I want a leading entry at the top left here. So swap some rows so that you have a non-zero thing up there. So I'm just going to swap row one and row three. You could have swapped row one and row two if you wanted to. Okay, now get towards row echelon form. Get a zero here. So I do this row echelon, or sorry, I do this row operation to get a zero here. Next leading entry is here now. I want to zero out the, thing, the things below it. Okay, so one more row operation. Now I'm in row echelon form. If I wanted to go all the way to reduce row echelon form, I could do that, but I don't have to. I just need any row echelon form. Now, what is the rank? Well, you can see it in two slightly different ways from this row echelon form. Method one, count the number of non-zero rows. Well, I see one, two non-zero rows, so that's the rank. Method two, count the leading entries or leading columns, same thing. Well, I see one leading entry and one leading column, and then I see two leading entries, two leading columns. So rank is two. Either way, rank is two, and then you're done. Okay, you just count up the no number of non-zero rows or number of leading entries. Alrighty, that'll do it for today. Next class, we will round out this week by looking at a related quantity called the nullity of a matrix. Okay, and instead of being the dimension of the range, this is just going to be the dimension of the null space. All right, so I'll see you next class for that.